now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. The concluding portion of a show we started one week ago today, the CBS Radio Workshop presentation of Space Merchants. Now, you heard the first part of this science fiction classic of the future in the grip of Madison Avenue last week at this time. Now, the conclusion of Space Merchants on Classic Radio Theater with Y of Tox. a cargo jet in the 22nd century. Here's a man we had trouble with in the hold, Lieutenant. What's his complaint? Well, he claims he's Mitchell Courtney, a copy smith star class of the Fowler's Shock and Advertising Company. He says he's been shanghaied aboard this jet. Roll up his sleeve. Let's see his social security tattoo. Uh... 1304-9974-1416-156-187723. Liar! <laughs> Get him out of here. If he's with shock and advertising, he'd have a low number. Can't you see it's been altered? Let me use the radio and talk to Mrs. Shockin himself. <laughs> Where from, Mr. Courtney? The dead? Take a look at this copy of today's New York Times, dated February 17th, 2157. Mitchell Courtney, head of the Venus Rocket Project at the Fowler Shock and Advertising Firm, has been found dead in Little America. Now, wait a minute. A man by the name of Matt Runstead knocked me out there. But can't you see that I'm alive? I am Mitchell Courtney. <laughs> you can prove that after ten years. Ten years. My manifest shows that you're not an advertising man. You're only a consumer named George Groby. You've signed up for ten years labor in Costa Rica. And those ten years begin as soon as this jet sets down. Take him back to the hold. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The CBS Radio Workshop continues part two of The Space Merchants by C.M. Kornbluth and Frederick Pohl. Today, the workshop resumes the story of Mitchell Courtney, copysmith star class with the world's greatest advertising agency of the future, Fowler Shock and Associates. The tale of a rocket ride to Venus. I lay on my filthy bunk in the hold of the cargo jet trying to think of a way to get back to New York. I wanted to find out why Matt Runstead had knocked me out and had me shanghaied. Who wanted to get me off the Venus Project, the advertising campaign we dreamed up to colonize Venus? I wanted to get back to my wife, Kathy. But there was nothing I could do until this cargo jet landed in Costa Rica. You scumskimmers, get in line. Now, what's your name? Mitchell Courtney. Mitchell Courtney. Oh, yeah. You're the bum we had trouble with on the plane. Oh, sorry, my name is George Groby. Oh, that's better. What do you want to do here, Groby? Got any choice of job? Anything. Anything the sun-drenched plantations of Costa Rica have to offer. I'm here to clasp the deft hands of independent farmers with pride in their work. I'm here to extract the juicy, ripe goodness of chlorella protein. Say, how'd you learn that? That's our prime impact commercial. Learn it. I wrote it. But don't let that stand in your way. Groby, you're not going to get anywhere being a wise guy. Yes, sir. You're assigned as a Chlorella Scum Skimmer third class. Report for duty and assignment to a bunk at Tier 48 in Dormitory Z. The 
heart of chlorella products is a strange, glutinous, ever-growing organism called Chicken Little. It provides one-third of the world with the protein that replaces old-fashioned meat. It grows in huge, sweating vats. And only the constant slicing keeps it from overgrowing and covering Costa Rica and its neighbors, or in time, the face of the earth. I had written of its delights many times in the agency, but I now came to know it at first hand. I was assigned to skim the scum which dripped from its sides. <laughs> she stinks pretty bad, don't you, Orke? She's high, Herrera. She's high. <laughs> but she's beautiful, Chicken Little, eh, Orke? Well, she's pretty awful. <laughs> Orke, this is the first time I ever hear you say the advertisements are wrong. <laughs> Go into town with me tonight, eh, Orke? I made one friend, a master slicer named Herrera. He'd been aloof and standoffish at first, befitting his high station, but now he'd befriended me, done me a lot of favors. I didn't know why until that night we went on the town to a dark, almost empty cafe. <laughs> Jorge, I have watched you very carefully. You don't belong here doing this work. Well, don't I? How am I ever going to get out? You have the brains, Jorge, not like the others. Oh, thanks. What good are brains here? I'm so tired half the time I can't think. Jorge, I'm going to put my life in your hands. Do you ever hear of the consis? The Concis, of course. You know what the Concis stand for? Sure, World Conservation Association. I mean their ideas. Oh, I know you have heard they are dangerous. Well, they want a revolution. They want to go back to the old ways. Real meat, real grains and fruits. They want a break for the consumer, they say. Nothing in packages, nothing tested and guaranteed. Do you think they are so wrong? After six months here? Here, Orke... Take this pamphlet. Read it. Then talk to me again. Hmm? Or denounce me. I am not afraid. The Concy Underground opposed everything a self-respecting 22nd century advertising man like me believed. I would have denounced Herrera to the Chlorella authorities the next day, except for one thing. If I joined the Concy's first... If I learned their organization and secrets, I'd have a better bargaining position in getting back to New York. I joined them. An ad man as a mole. From February 24, 1957, the CBS Radio Workshop presentation of Space Merchants on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Now more of the CBS Radio Workshop production of Space Merchants, as it was broadcast February 24, 1957, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Yeah, the irony was the Concies were a lot better organized than I'd suspected, and after six months, they decided they needed me in New York, and it was they who engineered my return to the city. <laughs> I returned to New York on a secret mission for the Concies. Two weeks after being in New York, I got the secret sign to attend a Concy meeting at the Metropolitan Museum. As my first taste of luxury in more than a year, I hailed a Cadillac pedicab and told the driver to take me to the Metropolitan Museum. You can't do better than to visit the Metropolitan Museum, mister. World's greatest masterpieces. 
Don't miss the painting on the first floor. It's called, I Dreamed I Was Ice Fishing in My Wonderform Bra. Yeah, I read it brought a million and a half. Not a cent less. And don't miss the theatrical collection. They got dancing cigarettes. Say, uh, you mind if we stop a second? These new Cadillac cabs are hard to pedal. Okay, get out. Oh, no, you don't. What's the idea of the gun? I recognize you when you walked out of Grand Central, Mr. Mitchell Courtney. What, what do you want with me? I want you to get out of the cab and come with me to the Taunton Agency. They've offered a big, fat, juicy reward for anybody who'll bring them the inside story of Fowler Shockin's Venus Rocket Project. And you're the boy who headed it up. So you're the boys who shanghaied me and got me off the project. No, we're not. I don't know who did. But we're sure glad we found you. The boy with all those nice secrets about colonizing Venus. Taunton wants those secrets. Come on, get out of here. Drop that gun. Drop it or I'll break your neck. I grabbed the gun and hit him behind the ear. Then I ran across Fifth Avenue and lost myself in a group of consumers on the sidewalk rolling back toward Shockin' Towers. I jumped off and ran to the express elevator. I walked down the corridor to Shockin's office. It was dark and deserted. Then down the corridor, I saw light under my old office door. I walked up to it. And I didn't knock. Hester. <gasps> Mitch! Oh, no. Hester, it's all right. I'm alive. Oh, but, but Mitch, they said you were dead. Who? Matt Brunston? Yes. Everyone believed him. Well, did my wife? Did Kathy believe him, Hester? Yes. Well, get her on the phone for me. Call her. Well, well, she's disappeared, Mitch. What? No one's been able to find her. After the news of your death, she just closed her office and disappeared. Maybe Shockin knows where she is. Where is Shockin, Hester? Well, he caught the moon rocket yesterday morning. He was going over your notes on the Venus Project. He's taking and... it over? Yes, from Matt Rudenstead. It was going badly, I'll Mitch. I'll bet. Matt's trying to ruin our campaign. Hester, you've got to get me aboard the next moon rocket. Use the name George Groby. Brunstead and the Taunton Agency will try to stop a man named Courtney. I've got a lot to tell, Mr. Shockin. Passengers, this way, please. We are now on the moon. Tourists to the moon to the left, visitors on business to the right. Now, sir, name? George Groby, copy analyst, class four. Groby, copy analyst, four. Oh. God, yeah. this way, please. Yes, sir. This man says his name is George Groby. Fine. You're under arrest, Groby. Let go of me. I'm here to see Fowler Shockin. Mr. Runstead down on the earth told us to expect you. I don't know what you're talking about. You may be interested to know that your secretary, Miss Hester Barnes, is being tried for treason. Treason? She is charged with forging documents and passing them to you. The 43rd Amendment to the United States Constitution. Treason to any registered advertising agency is punishable by death. Hold him for the return passage in a similar charge, guard. Guard had his nightstick in my back as we walked down the streets, past storefronts with signs, moon made fashions, stunning conversation pieces prove you were here. Souvenirs of Luna, cheapest in town. Moon suits rented, 50 years without a blowout. Ye tasty goodie shop on ye moon. Warren Astron, readings by appointment only. Hold it. Uh, what is it? You sure your name's Groby? Positive. You ever know a man named Herrera? Well, yes, Herrera and I... Wish we could find out what you're up to, Groby. Sent out of Costa Rica to report in New York, never show up at a meeting there, then you turn up at Fowler Shockin's agency and get your passage on a moon you rocket. You mean you're a... Shut cons- it up! Now, go into Astron's there. He'll hide you till our top boss up here comes. First, take my nightstick, knock me out with it, then point it at the streetlight and blast it out. Hit me hard, but not too hard. Oh, this is going to cost me two strikes in a week's pay. Oh. My concy training was really paying off. 
Astron took me in stride, hid me in a room under his floor, gave me something to eat, and I fell asleep. I waked with a light pouring down into my face. You can come up now, Groby. The chief is here to see you. In that room back there. I'll see you're not disturbed. Thanks. Over here, into the light, Mr. Groby. Kathy, Kathy, what are you doing here? Oh, Mitch, why didn't you stay on ice? What crazy thing have you done to turn up here? Go on, I'm crazy. Why shouldn't I be crazy? My wife, a kingpin consul. <laughs> what a shock. You, a star-class copysmith, married to a consul. Matt's one of you. You got Matt Runstead to Shanghai me. Mm, like a fool. I thought if I could get you away from Fowler's shock, and I might bring you to your senses. Trying to decide what was best for poor little Mitch. Mitch, I loved you. You loved me. You actually were in love with me. Yes, I was, in spite of everything you stood for. But you are not going to talk to Fowler Shockin. I'm not. Mitch, I don't want you to ruin Venus the way you've ruined the world. A woman of ideals. What do you plan to do with me? Are you going to report to Fowler Shockin? Yes. Then there is nothing I can do for you. Then let me tell you something before you turn me over to Astron and your friends outside. I've been shanghaied. Robbed of my name, forced to work like a slave in the tropics. I've had all I can take of others deciding what to do about poor old Mitch. Your guard friend left this nightstick with me. You know what he does, Kathy. Get on that phone and call Fowler Shockin' and tell him where I am. Then get out. Take your friends with you. I'll give you two days to vanish. But this time, stay out of sight forever. Go on. Call Shockin'. This is Dr. Nevins, Mitchell Courtney's widow. I'd like to speak to Mr. Shockin, please. Mitch, my boy, I'm going to fatten you up and turn Venus section back to you. You know my policy. Find a good horse, give him his head, and back him to the limit. You've never let me down. And Venus section's in rotten shape. Nobody's applying for space on the Venus rocket. The whole campaign's at sea. The indices are down to 3.37 for North America. They should be four and rising. We've got to get those 1,800 consumers on board the Venus rocket. When we got back to Earth, Matt Runstead had disappeared. I arranged for Hester to be released from Alcatraz, and she returned in triumph in Shockin's private jet. I began to whip the Venus rocket project back into shape. I was living again, writing new jingles, starting new rumors by word of mouth, developing new techniques, until finally... Mitch, the big day has come. 1,800 consumers have volunteered to ride our rocket to Venus. Now, I've arranged for Congress to meet tomorrow, and my boy, I want you to address them as Fowler Shockin's personal representative requesting a takeoff date. <laughs> Gentlemen, the Senate is now in session. You all received a recording of the opening prayer last night. So let's hear from the Senator from Chlorella Limited. Uh, the Senator from Chlorella Limited passes in deference to the Senator from Alaska Mining. The uh, Senator from Alaska Mining passes in favor of the Senator from United Steel and Smelting. The Senator from United Steel and Smelting passes in favor of the Senator from Caribbean Fruit. The senator from Caribbean Fruits passes in favor of the senator from Yummy Cola. My dear fellow senators, I thank you all for graciously allowing me to speak before we pass upon this very important bill concerning the Venus rocket. The people of this great republic of ours, extending from Atlantic seaweed to Pacific fish. Suddenly I sensed something had gone wrong. I'd been sitting back thinking about Kathy, thinking of her face, her voice, her smile before we'd married. I was wondering where she was, what she thought of all this. Then the speaker's voice focused my attention upon him. I hadn't been worried. Fowler Shockin owned two-thirds of this gathering. But there was something about old yummy Cola that troubled me. He wasn't addressing his fellows. He was looking up, addressing me. A big grin on his face. I leaned forward just in time for the weenie. ...to this project. In a brief discussion I had before this session, Mr. Taunton gave me some information in private. But I feel it my public duty 
to ask a couple of questions of Mr. Courtney, who is present. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if the name of George Groby is familiar to him. I would like to ask if Mr. Courtney is George Groby. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if, when he was known as George Groby, he was a member in good standing of the World Conservationist Association, <laughs> known to most of us loyal Americans <laughs> as the Conservation. <laughs> Below, there was a raging tidal wave of taunting congressmen and shocking congressmen battling. For the first time in history, shots were being fired in anger on the Senate floor. If Taunton hadn't tipped off old Yummy Cola, I knew who had the conscience. Somehow I didn't mind. I realized that for some time now, I'd really been one of them. A little man beside me, dressed in black, suddenly seized my arm and led me out the side door. You'll find a car outside, ready to take you to the airport, Mr. Courtney. What airport? Don't stop to ask questions. Just go wherever you're taken. You'll be protected. Fat chance. You'll be all right. I guarantee that. Who are you? The president. Good luck. God bless you. This is getting really crazy. From February 24th, 1957, the CBS Radio Workshop production of The Space Merchants. The conclusion comes up next. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Thank you for listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, straight ahead. But right now, the conclusion of the CBS Radio Workshop production of Space Merchants, February 24th, 1957. I had to admire that little man's courage. He'd walked back into that raging den of lions without a quiver. Aboard the jetliner, I wondered what would happen to him when they found out he'd sent me to safety. Or was it to safety? I tried to ask questions of the men aboard the liner, but they looked the other way and kept absolutely quiet. Climb out now, Mr. Courtney. They're all ready for you over there at the Venus rocket. There's no time to lose. Hey, look here, I don't want to go to Venus. (laughs) Who's in charge here? I won't go aboard that rocket. (laughs) Everybody's aboard but you. Come on, Mr. Courtney. In you go. Last passenger, fasten them in for the takeoff. Last passenger, ready for the takeoff. Kathy, Kathy, where are you? Up here, over your head. Stop floating around. Come down here and unfasten me. All right, I'll try. But we're beyond the law of gravity. We're on the way to Venus with 1,800 conservationists. How did you get out of a harness? 
A steward set me free, then floated away. I have to talk to you. <laughs> me? You threatened to kill me, remember? Yes, I remember. You could have, Mitch, in time. But you never told Shotgun who or where I was. Why didn't you? Because I love you, Kathy. And I think that for a long time I've been coming over to your side. And you're willing to face life on Venus? Yes. It's time people got a break. People, not consumers. Oh, I like hearing you say that. And I love you too, Mitch. <gasps> oh, Mitch. Mitch, you broke my hold on your harness. Well, come back here. I just wanted to put my arms around you. Oh, there'll be plenty of time for that on Venus. Come back here. <gasps> Unbuckle your harness and catch me. I can't. Uh, who invented this crazy gimmick anyway? <laughs> oh, Mitch. Mitch, you've stopped talking like an advertising man. Kiss me. The CBS Radio Workshop has presented part two of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles S. Monroe. Original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlovsky. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Stotts Cotsworth starred as Mitchell Courtney, Virginia Kay as Kathy. Others in the cast were Ralph Camargo, Leon Janney, Joseph Boland, Ian Martin, Jackson Beck, Ed Prentice, Joe Julian, Mary Patton, Bob Dryden... Ralph Bell, and Joe Helgeson. The sound effects were devised by Tom Buchanan and Tom Perkins, the engineer Jack Katz. This is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen again next week when from Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop presents The Engine No One Loved. It's the story of a Civil War locomotive that wound up its career in a children's amusement park. February 24th, 1957, the CBS Radio Workshop here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater, we wrap up the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Bennett Matter. This was from February 24th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Andy, I saw George Foley. I wasn't able to make him change his plea. Well, it was a good try, Johnny. Jury's still out? Yeah, that means they're arguing all the technical evidence. I was just thinking, no one really believes we'll get Arnold Bennett. What do you think? I think we will. I know we will. Well, if we can get Foley, we can get Bennett. We're... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, the uh, jury foreman just sent for the bailiff. I'll be right there. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Expense account item 11, 10 cents, one phone call to the hospital. 
The report on Arnold Bennett substantiated the newspaper story that he was recovering from the gunshot wound inflicted by his niece. Well, one thing, Johnny, he'll be alive for us if we can go after him. Oh, I wish it'd work with Foley. I think I could have made it work if that lawyer Eggleston hadn't been there. Well, it's after four. You know, if that jury doesn't come in with a verdict pretty soon, they'll have to adjourn for the night. Yeah. Want to smoke? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. I would like one. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, they're coming back in. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Come on. All right, it's stuffy in this courtroom. Yeah. Excuse me. Court is now in session. <laughs> Be seated. Has the jury reached a verdict in the case of the state versus George Foley? We have. Sir. Will you please read the verdict in this court? We... <coughs> we, the jury, find the defendant, George Foley, guilty as charged. That does it. Dollar! Dollar! See me, Dollar! Come see me! I got some things to tell you now. Who's this with you, Dollar? Andy Cord with the insurance company. Oh. Now, look, I haven't got any deals to offer, Foley. You know that. Yeah, I know. It's, so I took a chance. It's a lousy five more years. What about Arnold Bennett? Now, you're a little anxious. I want some information first. They only gave us ten minutes, Foley. Where's Bennett now? He's still in the hospital. He's going to be all right. He's out and I'm in. That's a break. Oh, come on, Foley. Let's have it if you have anything to say. Can you get Bennett? Can you really get him? I'll tell you frankly. We think we can get him with or without your help now. It doesn't make too much difference. Maybe it'll take longer without your help, but we'll get him. The fact that the court is going to convict you for having set fire to Bennett's office building is the lever we've needed. We can go after him now. You want to help us, Foley? I don't want to help you. You're a stinking insurance company, but I hate the idea, Bennett. Mr. Nolan do everything, running around, eating good food, and sleeping in his nice bed while I'm rotting away in prison. Sure, sure, he hired me to fire his building. He paid me 2,500 bucks to put the torch to that lousy building of his. He said he could throw all the blame on a guy named Tony Midas if it ever came up. We want the facts, Foley. How did he first contact you? Well, I... I got a friend who knows things, see? And my friend told me to contact him. When? A couple of days before the job. Come on, Foley, who's your friend? I'm going to tell you everything. Did you talk to Bennett in person about firing the building? I talked to him on the phone after my friend told me about him. Bennett said he wanted the place to go down because he's having money trouble, taxes and all, and he offered me a thousand bucks for the job. Now, wait a minute, Foley. You just said you got 2,500. I did, I did. I... I hung up on him when he offered me the thousand. I called him back later on and told him I wanted four thousand. Well, we argued about it and then finally hit on the twenty-five hundred. Did you meet him then? Sure. No, no, I never met him. I, I saw him once and I walked by the building and looked it over, but I never met him. Bennett's niece said she saw you two together, Foley. A sworn statement. Yeah, you know, she's a liar. How about the money? How'd he pay it to you? He left it for me in the check stand at the bus terminal over on Fourth Street. I told him how to do that and when to leave it. Now, let me get this straight, Foley. You made the deal to fire the building over the phone. Then you went ahead and looked at the job. You never talked to Bennett in person? That's right. And you made arrangements for him to pay you $2,500 by leaving it in the check stand at the bus terminal. Yeah, yeah. When did you make these arrangements? The day before the job. How'd you work it? I just told you. I mean the money. Oh, uh, half of it the first time, and after the job was over, he, he left the other half for me. And you got it all? Sure, sure, in cash. Why were you trying to see him in the hospital after he was shot? To try and shake him down for another five? Oh, Johnny. brother. Come on, let's start over. Well, what do you mean? Oh, you're trying to sell us a bill of goods here. For what reason, I don't know, but I know this. You had to meet Bennett. You had to see him, Foley. You had to talk it over with him personally. I just told you I picked up the money in the bus time. I don't believe that. Bennett wouldn't have left the money for you to pick up. You could have just gone away with it. And after the building was burned, if it had been that way, Bennett didn't have to pay you the balance. Now, when did you see him? 
It's pretty important to know when and where and how many times you and Bennett got together. Thought you said you could get him whether I told you anything or not. We can, we can, brother. Don't ever doubt that. But if you tell us some facts, we can get him faster. All right, now. Where did you first meet him? Was it in a restaurant? Someplace with people around? No, no. Uh, I met him in his car. He he was parked on Market Street near 5th. That's the way we arranged to meet each other over the phones. Did anybody see you meet him? People on the street, I guess. When did this meeting happen? Night I torched his building. He paid you then? Yeah. The whole 2500 Yeah, all of it. All What'd you do with the money? Never mind. Do you still have it? Never mind. Oh, this is a waste of time. You aren't telling us anything. Well, why should I? Well, why'd you call us here if you didn't have anything to say? Well, I'm saying something. You guys aren't listening. <laughs> We continued questioning Foley about his association with Arnold Bennett. Each time he explained it, it was a different story. The only thing he admitted was that Bennett had hired him to fire the building. As far as the details of it were concerned, they were lost in a jumble of contradictory answers he gave us. Expense account item 12, $5.60, dinner for Andrew Cord and myself. The next morning, we return to the Hall of Justice to question George Foley once more. All right, Foley. Now, how much did you say Arnold Bennett paid you for the job? A thousand dollars. You told us twenty-five hundred one time. Another time, you said five thousand. Now, come on, what was it? A thousand dollars. And when did he pay you? Right after I fired the building. I met him right afterwards down on the street in his car. He asked me if it was all set, and I told him to listen for the sirens. Pretty soon, somebody put in the alarm and the fire engines come out. He paid me that, all right. The place was three quarters gone by that time. He knew I did a good job. Where was this you met him now? A couple of blocks from the building. Did anybody see you together? No. Where did you telephone him from? From my place. The same night you started the fire? Yeah, yeah. And he brought you the money that night, and you cased the building that night, and you started the fire. All all this in one night. You got it. Now, that's the ticket, boys. It became increasingly evident that Foley was attempting to convince us that he was mentally deranged. In spite of the fact that he'd already been tried and found guilty and was slated to appear at 10.30 the following morning for sentencing. It's an old trick, and with arsonists, where sanity is questioned from the beginning, a good one. However, Foley had been examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the courts. I waited in the jail cell with Foley while Andy Cord went out to get copies of their findings. When he returned, we showed them to Foley. Okay, good. Here you are, John. Well, what do you show me these things for? To let you know there's no way to get out of it now, Foley. These are from psychiatrists. All of them had a good look at you. You're sane. You're all right. You remember when they looked at you? No. All right, look at the dates on the paper. You can read, can't you? Sure. January 15th, January 16th, January 21st. Witnesses were around for all the examinations. Well? Well? Are you through playing games now? Okay, Dolly, you guys win. (laughs) Come on, give us the story. Well, I met Arnold Bennett at the Hopkins bar about a month before the fire. I made sure I'd meet him there. Now, what do you mean, Foley? Well, I've been setting fires for a living for a long time now. I always have a list of people like Bennett who could use a fire. They get around. I knew he was in trouble four or five years ago with the income tax people. They sent a guy to prison for cover-up. Tony Midas. Yes, Tony Midas. I figured he'd be needing another one pretty soon, so... We had a drink. I brought it up. Who paid for the drinks? He did. Who saw you together? The bartender. Name is uh, Alfred. It was a made a D there, a couple of people at the table. I put the proposition up to him. How do you like to have his building burnt down and collect his $500,000 get himself out of trouble? Well, he said he'd like that fine. I told him it cost him 5000 bucks in advance. He said he couldn't raise that much, but he did manage to get 3500 together. I took it and I, I did the job. What'd you do with the money? I still got it. Where? It's not going to do me any good now. I buried it in a gallon can of vacant lot over by the tower. I could show you where. Okay. We'll get you to do that. Swell, I'll be glad. Hey. What? 
I can send Bennett up the same way you're sending me up. Huh. I can testify against him at his trial. The next morning at 10.30, George Foley received the maximum sentence. Two hours later, charges were filed against Arnold Bennett, naming him for conspiracy, arson, attempted defraud, and collusion. A warrant was issued for his immediate arrest, but it was never served. Arnold Bennett died in the hospital that night. In a way, you could still say that no one ever beat him. He beat himself. Expense account item 13, $87.50, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 14, another $125, transportation back to Hartford. Item 15, $35, miscellaneous. Expense account total, $1,440.37. Remarks? Nothing. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Fathom Five matter. Death on the high seas. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Stacey Harris, Chet Stratton, Will Wright, Marvin Miller, Hans Conried, Edgar Barrier, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And that wraps up the Bennett Matter from February 24th, 1956, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. My friend Ted over at RadioMemories.com has all the yours truly Johnny Dollar stories available on cassette, CD, or flash drive. Visit him at RadioMemories.com. That's RadioMemories.com. Visit my webpage, which is at classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about classic radio collecting, and contact me there. Classicradio.stream. Our programs are available at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, through Amazon, and Audible. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks so much for making us a part of your day. Thank this radio station. A card or a letter to them would mean more than you could possibly imagine. Just drop them a note. And then and thank, support the sponsors, too. It's their a, a financial support that keeps this radio station on the air. And tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the radio dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.